Hello there guys and welcome back to another installment of Trey the Explainer. Hope everyone had a great holiday break and start to the new year of 2019. Today we have a special episode as we will be, I know to some must be, finally talking about paleontology on this channel for once. I've taken a break from my paleontology roots lately, mainly because it's been hard to write about. In 2018, I expanded my video topics considerably, notably to anthropology, cryptozoology, and of all things religious studies. I've been almost a little bipolar switching back and forth between video topics, almost on a whim, and sorry if that has been upsetting to anyone. It seems my interests shift constantly and I find it hard to write scripts for stuff I found fascinating only a short while before. No more is this more noticeable when looking at the plans I had for 2018 video topics a year ago. Really, only a few of those video ideas on that list actually were made, and a bunch were made that were definitely not on that list. Sorry about that. I hope you guys liked the videos. Uh, please don't riot. I digress. Regardless, this video is the time that I annually talk about some of the scientific paleontological discoveries made in the last year. And a lot certainly happened in this year paleontologically speaking, but because as always I'm pressed for time, I decided to condense this year's discoveries to what amounts to my personal favorites and highlights. If you want to hear pretty much every discovery of 2018, check out this video, which was a collaboration effort between a bunch of paleontology YouTubers. All of us were given a month of the year. I'm in it, I got the discoveries for the month of May. So please check that out. Anyways, let's start. Baby Spinosaurus. Not much can be said about Spinosaurus that you guys haven't heard before. It is one of the most recognizable dinosaurs out there, in addition to being one of the largest carnivores to ever have walked the Earth. Well, a tiny fossil discovered last year allowed us to see a different side of this creature. A paper aptly titled The Smallest Biggest Theropod Dinosaur describes a finger bone that resembles that of a Spinosaurus almost identically. The one difference is that the bone is minuscule compared to most known Spinosaurus specimens. It has been inferred that the bone belonged to a baby Spinosaur, the juvenile perhaps would have only have been around 2 meters long. You or I could have held it in our arms. It is crazy to think something that small could grow to the size of a great leviathan given enough food and time. Additionally, the flattened shape of the bone suggests, like its adult counterparts, baby spinosaurs spent most of their time in or around water. I couldn't help but think about documentaries about baby crocodiles being cared for by their mothers on the banks of rivers in Africa, and wondering if something similar was done by these dinosaurs who resembled them so much. Giant Dicenodonts. Probably one of the absolute strangest yet fascinating periods in Earth history has to be the time shortly after the Permian mass extinction, which took place just before the reign of the dinosaurs and probably was responsible for it. So let's set the scene. About 252 million years ago, something happened. We're not sure exactly. It could have been extremely violent volcanic activity, an asteroid impact, the destruction of the ozone layer, a whole bunch of other factors, or a ton of these put together. Regardless of what the cause was, there was a massive extinction event. One that dwarfs the KPG mass extinction, otherwise known as the one that killed most of the dinosaurs. The Permian-Triassic mass extinction, aka the Great Dying, was the truly mind-boggling destruction of Earth's ecosystems and organisms. With about 96% of marine species and 70% of terrestrial species disappearing in a rather short period of time. Just think about that for a moment. That's a lot of animals. Extinction was so bad that it took 5 to 30 million years for life on Earth to get close to recovering to what it was like previously. The extinction was pretty much a holocaust of life on this planet, and was probably the closest animal life has gotten to ceasing to exist. As bad as it was, it was not the end, and life continued on, as it always has since the beginning. Those lucky few species who survived the extinction would inherit the earth left behind, and would diversify once more to populate the earth and make it colorful and beautiful once more. Every single living thing we see today descended from a survivor of this event. One can only imagine if the extinction was slightly worse. What if our mammalian ancestors or those of the dinosaurs did not survive the event? Who would have taken our place in the subsequent fallout? It's difficult to say. Science fiction author and artist C.M. Kozman created an alien world called Cynad, where life evolved rather similar to our own. However, a mass extinction occurred in its prehistory, resulting in effects far worse than the Permian mass extinction on our Earth with all life bigger than microscopic organisms and pond water dying out, leaving a world of germs to inherit the world, and evolve and rebound once again. 
Regardless, the effects of the Great Dying on Earth were massive, and who survived and who didn't had unbelievably large effects on the world we know today. If things turned out a little differently, who knows who would inhabit the Earth in our place? I don't know, um, shark people? As we know, things did eventually rebound, but in the first few million years following the extinction, something truly bizarre happened. One of the few animals to survive the mass extinction was a group of small mole-like creatures called dicynodonts. These little creatures were closer related to us than dinosaurs or lizards. Now the weird part is, is that these little dudes dominated the world for a short while. What paleontologists have found in the fossil beds shortly after the mass extinction is that these dicynodonts and their descendants made up 95% of all terrestrial vertebrate species on Earth at that time. That is to say, unlike today where we have a wide range of species all around the world, horses, giraffes, crocodiles, lions, buffaloes, bats, birds, lizards, wolves, and goats. In that time, there were only dicynodonts. Dicynodonts as far as the eye can see. Every forest, every plain, every watering hole, and every valley or hill everywhere, only dicynodonts could be found. It is probably difficult for us to wrap our heads around. The world would have been a drab place indeed. The world would have been almost like a video game with reused NPCs with the same designs everywhere. Oh gosh, do something different. It's certainly weird and it's not exactly clear why the specific group became so widespread and popular. It might have been something as simple as dumb luck. A favorite paleontology internet personality of mine, Nick's Drawl Stuff, included the predicament in his or her list of unsolved paleontological mysteries. The reign of the dicynodonts was short, and soon they would be gradually replaced by new species as the world would diversify, and eventually they would be fully replaced by the dinosaurs and other species. Anyways, getting back to 2018, a new specimen was discovered belonging to a dicynodont. It lived towards the end of the Triassic and might have been essentially the dicynodont's last hurrah. This particular dicynodont was far more massive than any known before. It was the size of an elephant and was the largest non-dinosaurian tetrapod of its time. Soft tissue. Last year was a great year for soft tissue preservations and fossils. It is rare for anything besides the calcified bones and exoskeletons of animals to preserve as fossils, but every now and then special conditions allow for the preservation of soft tissue structures like hair, skin, feathers, scales, muscle, and fat. One of such fossils was discovered last year, and has led to very significant implications. The running theme of modern paleontology lately has been discovering that prehistoric creatures were more like those of modern day than previously thought. Ichthyosaurs were a branch of marine reptiles that evolved a lot superficially to resemble mammalian dolphins of today, and they likely would have played a similar role in their ancient ecosystems. If the tail fluke and dorsal fin wasn't enough, the resemblances went even further this year with the discovery of a certain ichthyosaur which possessed blubber, a layer of fatty tissue that kept the reptile warm in those Jurassic seas. The discovery also revealed that some ichthyosaurs were not the cold-blooded reptiles once thought, but, as the blubber suggests, were warm-blooded like us mammals and birds. There was more ichthyosaur news made in 2018 as well. A paper examined the fossil remains from the Jurassic of what was previously believed to be a dinosaur. The largely fragmentary remains discovered in the UK were re-examined and reinterpreted as being the jawbones belonging to an ichthyosaur, the largest known ichthyosaur in history. What is currently and tentatively called the Lilstock ichthyosaur, estimated from these bones, might have approached 26 meters long, a length rivaling that of the largest known animal in known history, the blue whale. Who knows how many giants existed in our past? Perhaps this is just one of many. Hello, this is Trey the Explainer with the 2018 Feather Report. One feathered dinosaur was discovered this year. A small crow-sized dinosaur called... Uh... I'm all bad with pronunciations, just read the word, was discovered just at the beginning of this year. The coloration of the feathers of this little dinosaur was determined. Its feathers were iridescent like those of a crow, and were colored in a wide range of hues, making them very beautiful in life and probably resembling those of a hummingbird. We also discovered the footprints of the tiniest raptor ever discovered. The juvenile, sparrow-sized dromaeosaur could have fit in the palm of your hand. Oh my goodness, that's so cute. And, uh, oh yeah, we aimed a dinosaur Thanos. Mm. In 
And yeah, that's about it as far as discoveries I found super interesting and significant. So yeah, I think that concludes this paleontology recap of 2018. And I have to say I'm a little disappointed, but maybe better luck next year. What? Wait, what's this? Oh my god. Oh yeah, that business. As with keeping with tradition, a big paleontology discovery that could rewrite the entire evolutionary history of dinosaurs has occurred again. Last year it was Ornischia and Saurischia, possibly not being a thing, and this year we got pterosaur feathers for Pete's sake. So, to those unfamiliar, feathers and dinosaurs have become ever increasingly more and more intertwined over the years. The evolutionary history of feathers is murky, to say the least. Fuzzy and feather-like structures have been found all throughout the branches of Dinosauria, which has led to wide speculation on how prevalent these fuzzy structures were in dinosaurs in general. Now, the big question is, when did feathers evolve first exactly, and who had them? At first, it was believed only the bird branch of dinos had them, but later discoveries extended this to the ancestors of birds and their close relatives. But later discoveries made us reconsider, in that it might have began in theropods, two-legged dinosaurs in general. But later discoveries again made us reconsider, and that it might have began in the common ancestors to all dinosaurs. Well, a recent discovery now suggests that feathers might have evolved First, way further back than once believed, with feathers preceding the evolution of dinosaurs entirely. Let me explain. Pterosaurs, or pterodactyls to those unfamiliar, are flying reptiles that are the dinosaurs' closest relatives without being dinosaurs themselves, splitting from one another probably sometime in the early Triassic. Now, we have known for a while that pterosaurs possessed fuzz or hair-like structures that covered their entire bodies called pinkofibers. These pinka fibers strongly resemble the most primitive versions of feathers found in some dinosaurs, namely the stage 1 feathers, which were more like knobs than sort of the branching feathers we are familiar with today. It was long since theorized that the two shared a common origin with one another, or were related in some way. Well, that's where the 2018 pterosaur discovery comes in, as it somewhat confirms that theory, well, with some new issues. Two highly well-preserved specimens of a tiny little flying bugger were found in China. When paleontologists examined the soft tissue preservations around the skeleton, they found the remains of pterosaur pinkofibers on its skin. But these pinkofibers were unlike any of those previously discovered. Unlike the previously known ones, these pinkofibers were far more complex and highly resembled the more advanced feather types in dinosaurs, like stage 2 and 3 feathers, to the point they were essentially indistinguishable from dinosaur feathers. This is very significant, as it was believed that feathers originally evolved millions of years after these two groups split, and only in dinosaurs. And pinka fibers and feathers independently evolved from a yet-to-be-discovered primitive fuzz that was neither pinka fiber or dinosaur feather. This discovery instead possibly rewrites the entire model. Pinka fibers are not just related to or evolved from a common origin from feathers, but are feathers themselves, if what the paleontologists speculate is correct. If true, feathers are a far more ancient trait in this branch of reptiles than initially believed. For a feather all dinosaurs freak like me, it is promising news, as it provides support to the idea that the ancestors of all dinosaurs, from the long-necked sauropods, to the horned ceratopsids, to even, yes, the mighty T-Rex, were covered in feathers. Some paleontologists are not entirely on board, however. Some suggest the resemblance between these pinka fibers and dino fuzz is just coincidental, and the two evolved independently from one another, and resemblances can be deceiving. Even so, if evolved independently from one another, the tale of the two fuzzes is a very fascinating case of convergence indeed. Regardless, this discovery really makes things interesting for paleontologists, as it just further illustrates that pterosaurs and dinosaurs both probably were not much like the lizards of their namesake, but were their own thing and a lot of them were covered in weird fuzzy structures rather than scales. Whatever interpretation you support for the time being, the implications are fascinating, and it's always great to see discoveries that could completely upend the current beliefs in paleontology. All in all, 2018 was a pretty good year for paleontology, and for myself in general. It's been a journey, and it's crazy for me to look back on the last year of my life. 
I feel like in 2018 especially, I changed and matured a lot than the previous years. I feel like I am now a different person than the last. Harder and more solemn, but also happy and content at the same time. All the while, you guys, at least hopefully, watched and enjoyed my content. Thank you for the memories, and thank you for being there for me. Hope you enjoyed my hand reveal. Maybe someday in the distant future, I might reveal something a little bit more. Oh gosh, not like that. Alright, this has been a Paleontology Recap of 2018. None of my predictions from last year came true, like always, so I think I'm just not going to do a prediction because I never get them anyways. You guys can tell me some of your predictions in the comments section instead. Anyways, thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next time. I hope we go on so many more great adventures this coming year. I got everything from mermaids to far future beasts planned, so I hope we have some fun. Alright, goodbye. What a beautiful world this will be. What a glorious time to be free.